Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Everything and More. I really appreciate uh, Wall Street Weightlifter coming on and chatting with us. I do have to apologize to him and the audience. My connection was horrible, and so it's a little tough to listen to. Um, but get through it because he's got some awesome advice, and uh, I think this guy's going places. I really appreciate his time and his patience with uh, the bad connection, and I hope you guys enjoy today's episode. All right, man. Well, hey, I really appreciate you taking some time and getting on here and chatting a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I always just refer to you as Wall Street weightlifter because that's what you are on on Instagram. So I'll always, you know, ask people at the gym or whatever, hey, do you follow Wall Street weightlifter? And if they don't, then I tell them to because your content's awesome. You're super strong. Your refrigerator is incredible. Um, so I just wanted to get on and, and chat a little bit and, and, uh, learn you, learn your story. Okay. Well, you know what? I'll start with the, uh, with the wall street weightlifter nickname. Um, I actually started working at Merrill Lynch a few years back and for anyone that's gone through some kind of like financial advisory training program, you know, we were, we we're goofing around in the office. And I had the idea came to me because everyone's sitting around like, you know, they're, they're talking about how to leverage social media and use that to generate leads. And I said, well, you know, I've got to change the name. Uh, I was just going off of my, my regular name at the time. So like, I got to have something catchy. Like when you come across it, like you got, it's got to be something eye catching that you stop and look at. So yeah, um, I was in there and I thought, you know, everyone goes with like the, uh, it's almost always like a two name kind of deal so it's, it's biceps and whatever or yeah it's always some kind of a trick in there so i had a i had a, a handful of them most of them were dumb most of them were like just goofing off and i thought uh well what about wall street weightlifter like and i thought oh that i'm gonna stick with that one and so i actually had to type it out because you're only allowed a certain number of characters yeah. But, oh man, I gotta check and make sure that's not too long. So I counted them, thought about it for a bit. I said, all right, whatever, I'm gonna change it. And I didn't really use social media that much um, back then because the regulation on it's kind of tight. So you're you're extremely limited in what you can post uh, in regards to finance. Okay. Uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the people that post heavily. Um, it's not individuals that are licensed. Yeah. So they're not, they're not up to the same level of scrutiny. So I didn't use it that much when I was at Merrill Lynch and I kind of slowly just started using a little bit more and more. And I started really posting with uh, COVID. Yeah. And so once COVID hit, I started doing more stuff online. You know, we did what a lot of gyms did, which is transition our members to virtual and then it just kind of grew from there. I kind of got in the habit of, instead of posting like once every two weeks or something, uh, using some of the new features and posting more often, and then being forced to start explaining stuff at first to our members, and then just kind of laying out some of the principles that we use and how we train. Um, and it just grew from there. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, you just have good, solid content, so whatever you're doing, just keep it up. Um, do, do you feel like that got you more leads as far as, you know, your, your financial advising stuff? Uh, it's, it's gotten some, uh, I left, I left Merrill Lynch. I started, uh, my own investment advisory firm. So it's, it's, it's primarily friends and family. Yeah. So a lot of the people I have not, I have not, really grown at the scale yet yeah so it's um it's helpful to generate leads but i think most of the people on social media are a little bit younger yeah and i haven't i haven't quite had the time to then kind of articulate all of those concepts about finance yeah because we're just busy doing other stuff we got kids we got a gym to run yeah we got other clients to take care of 
So by the time you, by the time you sit down and really start making the content, um, for that, it, it's, it's just a time constraint for sure. And I'm i I'm an amateur at this stuff. I just, I, uh, my, my real content strategy, I don't follow any type of uh, like, uh, template or any kind of anything from any guru or something. Yeah. It's just that something pops up, something pops up at the gym, something we talk about, you know, some aspect of training that I thought about. Yeah. Uh, and then I just write about it. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, so what all do you do? <clears throat> like you guys have your gym, you said you have kids, you do some financial advising. Do you do anything else? That's mostly it. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's a lot of stuff. So you do, <laughs> <laughs> you, you do a lot. Um, what's your gym? Our gym is CrossFit Valley View. Cool. Located, located in uh, Las Vegas, California. Okay. And how long have you done that? Well, my wife started the gym uh, 10 and a half years ago now. That's awesome. So you're a, a decade so affiliate. How, yeah, the uh, the gym was how we met. So I'm uh, I was at the time I was 22, and I had taken a break from school. So most of my family works in construction, and I took a break from school. I wasn't sure uh, what I wanted to do. And I came down to California because no one, you know, I, I actually grew up in Oregon. Okay. So nobody wanted to come to California for this job. Yeah. So my dad gave me a call and he said, Hey, you know, we're going to have this spot open. Nobody wants to go. So, you know, a spot is open for you. If you want to come down here, um, here's where it's going to be located. And at the time I had thought, you know, because Oregon is, about 4 million people and California is 40 million. So I, I, in my head, I thought, you know, I partially plan to move to California at some point anyways, just because it's, it's a larger state, it's more populous. You're going to have more opportunity. And at the time I only took a break from school because I was, I didn't want to be in that trap that a lot of people are in where you aren't really sure what you do and you just kind of take stuff and do stuff just because it's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. You know, I had, I had fulfilled all, I fulfilled all of like the general requirements and you're at the point where you're like, you have to pick a major yeah. and decide what you're doing. So I was like, Oh dude, I don't really want to pick. And I was in this, I was, I said, the only thing I know for sure is I don't want to be broke. <laughs> yeah. So I said, I, this whole like, this whole like being broke and like scraping by, um, I'm not about that. Yeah. Because, you know, like I said, most of my family's in construction. So if you're young and able bodied and willing to work hard, just being broke to me is like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of opportunity out there. And I just thought, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to be broke. So I'm going to take a break. I'll return. And this opportunity came up, came to come, come to California. I said, well, let's go. So I packed my car, drove down, started working. And I had worked here for probably seven months before I came to a CrossFit gym for the first time. Yeah. And that was how I met my wife was that she owned the gym. That's awesome. What kind and of construction? My, my introduction to, this is building water treatment plants. Okay. So that's how you started to get strong. That's how I started. That's how I started <laughs> as a kid, really. Yeah. So as a kid, as a kid, you know, just working around the house, uh, I was competitive. You know, I was competitive. I grew up in a blue collar family where, you know, being able to work and being strong is valued. And so all the way from as far back as I can remember, you know, if I was doing a project around the house with my dad and he's, he's carrying, you know, two, two by fours, I'm like, well, I got to carry three. <laughs> I still so, do that with my dad. <laughs> even as a kid. So, 
or if or if his if his wheelbarrow's you know half full, I'm like, well, mine's got to be three quarters full. <laughs> yeah. So that's that started, you know, that that really started at like a really young age, where that's just you you grow up with a certain lifestyle or a certain culture, and it's not it, it stays with you forever. Yeah. But I, I originally came to the gym. I came to the gym because I was training strongman at the time. And I was going to this commercial gym and I thought, you know, I'm just wasting too much time with waiting for equipment <clears throat> and just getting lost in the shuffle of like, I'm waiting here, dealing with uh, the, the typical commercial gym problems that you deal with. And I, I started off as a CrossFit hater early on. So when I, my first introduction, I was like, oh, that stuff's silly. I'm not doing that. Yeah. So I, I, I agreed with CrossFit in theory, you know, but not, not necessarily the application of it at first. So, you know, I was your typical, like, power lifter turned strongman competitor. And... You know, my first my first love was strongman. Yeah. And I thought, well, if you really think about it, if you really break it down, strongman is just CrossFit at higher density. You know, most of your events are they're not one rep maxes. They are max reps for a minute. There's there's stuff for time. Uh, you you're working a variety of different athletic qualities. Yeah. So where CrossFit typically is testing over, you know, five to 10 minutes, Strongman is doing the same thing, but testing you over a minute. Yeah. You know, it's not a one rep max sport. So all the rules that apply to Strongman apply to CrossFit as well. But they're more similar than they are different. And once people started to get strong in CrossFit, you know, somewhere around like 2012, eh, 2011, 12, like, there was a couple of years where the top guys made some huge jumps. Yeah. Like those jumps, those jumps that they were making between like 10 to 11 to 12. I looked at it like, Hey man, I, I don't know what they're doing over there, but I got to know what they're doing. Yeah. Something's going on because at first, at first you could be really strong, show up and crush everybody in the workout. Yeah. Now these guys, these guys are getting close what high level specialists are lifting you know they're getting they're getting close enough to what the top power lifters the top weight lifters you know the top guys are doing you know they're not at the same level but they're close enough when you add all these other things in that clearly the strength training portion of what they're doing is working yeah so i first came just because i wanted to have a, a dedicated spot to work out where um, I didn't have to, I didn't have to deal with, um, I didn't have to deal with just people in the way waiting all the time. And then second, I said, you know what? I do want to learn what's going on over there. I'll try some stuff out. I think it might have some benefit. And <clears throat> I started looking more and more at the CrossFit journal. So I got like a, a slight introduction to CrossFit. Uh, I went through my wife's two week intro program. I did all the classes, all the, learned all the basics, uh, started reading a bit about the CrossFit journal. And I realized that everything, basically everything in CrossFit was stolen. Like, wait a second, these guys didn't come up with anything. Like they're just taking what the top people are doing in all these sports, dialing it back just a hair off of those like end margins and trying to squeeze like the best ideas of each modality and just cut off at the point where like you kind of go down the rabbit hole of that sport. Yeah. So like, let's take all the best ideas out of powerlifting, but let's just, let's just take it back a hair before you start getting into like the deep end. Same thing with weightlifting and gymnastics and, and the different endurance aspects. They're taking their best ideas and, and just bringing it back a hair. And so when I'm looking at CrossFit, I thought, you know, I have to, if, if you disagree with what CrossFit's doing, 
you're not disagreeing with CrossFit. You're disagreeing with what the, what the top powerlifters in the world are doing. Or you're, you're disagreeing with what the top endurance athletes are doing. You know, this isn't, this isn't like weightlifting for CrossFit. It's just weightlifting. Yeah. Or, you know, when you jump on a rower, it's not rowing for CrossFit. This is when, when they conduct some of the seminars, this is, these are the best rowers in the world. Like, you're really going to argue with what, what they say. They might have a slightly different application because this person wants to be the best rower in the world. And this person wants to be a slightly more balanced athlete, but the principles are the same. It's so like to argue against the, the principles of CrossFit. I've got to, I've got to argue against the principles of like the the best people in the world at each individual sport, because I could see it right away with powerlifting. Like I've read enough stuff from all from everyone out there about powerlifting. Like, oh man, they stole all their stuff. Yeah. Like this is all stolen, and then you realize that when they cover every other domain, uh, they stole that stuff too. Yeah. So then I, I realized like, Hey, they're, the theory is, is, is phenomenal. The, there's a gap between the theory and the application. And that gap is closing and closing. So we're now we're looking at what, what a lot of people are doing and you're like, man, these, these people are incredible. Yeah. <laughs> that gap has gotten smaller and smaller. And because I started in, in, in Strongman, I remember, you know, when they had the first World Strongest Man competition, and they were a bit of a train wreck. Like those first couple years, they were a train wreck, and they brought in people from different strength sports. They brought in track athletes, they brought in bodybuilders, weightlifters, powerlifters. Nobody was really a strongman yet. You did some other sport. And now we're combining elements of all the strength sports to create this new sport of strongman. And your first couple of years were a mess. Yeah. And people learned how to train for strongman. You know, they realized, like, well, wait a second, this is a slightly different thing. It's not exactly like one of these. So we're going to combine elements of that. And the, the, the difference in performance from those first competitions to just 10 years down the road was, was gigantic. And your first champion, your first real strongman champion, which was Bill Kazmaier, he was the pioneer of like showing people what's possible <clears throat> in the sport of strongman. Yeah. And I, I, I realized like, wait a second, you know, CrossFit's doing a similar thing where they're bringing in people of, of different, uh, you know, different backgrounds. And so you can look at the progression of strongman and how that evolved and see a very similar path among CrossFit. So the CrossFit games have only been around for 15 years. Yeah. You know, and you look at that progression, you look at that progression from 2007 to 2022 and you're like, wow, that is, that is a huge difference. Yeah, it's insane. They're, not, they're two different worlds. Yeah. And if you look at Strongman, which started exactly 30 years prior, and look at the difference in performance from 1977 to 1992, which by that time people had figured out how to train for Strongman. Yeah. You're like, wow, these guys crushed them. And now you got to look at, you look at 1992 to 2022, and there's, there's multiple levels that, they, that they've reached in that time. You know, to the point where it's like a guy from 92 would just get blown out. Yeah. If he tried to compete in, in 2022. And CrossFit is going to make that same leap. You know, we're looking at people now as like, oh, how could they get better? It's like, no, oh, no, 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 they're, they're going to get better. Yeah. They're going to get way better. Because we've, we've already seen this exact same thing. They learned, you know, by 92, like they in 15 years, they learned mostly – how to train for strongman but then it just continued to make the leap yeah like every few years a new champion with new methods and new ideas comes along and pushes the sport forward and now we're seeing that through crossfit you know yeah. huge leap in the first few years we got our, our our first champion in rich froning 
and then you get your next repeat champion. Now we have another repeat champion on a run, and that's that's exactly the evolution that happened through Strongman. That's so Terrible interesting. I, I didn't years. see that connection. That's really cool. A, a first few terrible years, then a true champion, and then multiple true champions that just leap out and crush everyone for, for years. Um, and people learn from it. And people take those ideas and realize that we can get even better and even better. So when you look at, at I'm sure people in 92 thought, damn, this, we've been around for 15 years. We figured it all out. And we look back 30 years and they're like, you guys didn't know anything. Yeah. You know, we'll look, we'll look at CrossFit 30 years from now and being like, oh yeah, those guys are primitive. They didn't know what they were doing. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, Just the other day we were at the gym and we were watching, it was, I don't remember what year, but it was Amanda and uh or they were doing the workout amanda and it was jason kalipa and miko salo and and um chris uh spieler and dude it's just so funny to see like 135 and muscle ups and them failing at it and it's like you know we're we're only a few years past that and that's what females are doing amanda at higher weight and higher reps like it's crazy Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really cool progression. Um, so you started to get get into CrossFit. You went through your your two week um, beginner class with your wife and started to kind of dive into that CrossFit had pulled from all those areas. Which, as you were saying that, you know, I was thinking even in the early days, CrossFit was taking Louis Simmons and um, you know Mike Bergner and just some of the 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 greats within there sport and and pushing it along um so where did you go from there well i started you know i i came to the gym signed up started coming to classes um mostly still trained on my own and then i signed up for the level one the level one went to it and said you know what i'm going to give this i'm going to give this whole thing a fair shake you know let's see you know, let's see what it's about. Let's see what what is the foundation of which CrossFit is standing on. Um, and I thought the level one was great. Yeah. I thought, you know, I went there. I went there. And I, I tried to go in and say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep a totally open mind and pretend like I don't know anything about, uh, you know, how to lift weights right now. And for for how much negative coverage you know crossfit gets about the level one and how you can just go attend a weekend seminar and all this stuff i went and i thought dude that wasn't my experience at all yeah like that's that's not what happened at all number one there's really nothing that occurred through that seminar that i can disagree with i mean from from technique to progression the concept of mechanics consistency intensity the concept of virtuosity the concept of all these of, of all these things is really very minimal that I could I can disagree on, and what I do disagree on is going to be like minor details. Yeah. So, and when I was there, and this was twenty, this is very early twenty fourteen. I think I got it in January of fourteen. Was when I got the level one. I left and I said, and pretty much everyone there was like, "Dude, the level one's not enough." Like the the people there, one of the persons was a games athlete. One was oh, it was Justin Berg was the flow master. Uh, it was the owner of a large gym, and everyone everyone from CrossFit HQ was there saying like, "Hey, your level one's not enough. This doesn't make you a coach. You need to get experience. You need to work on your skills. You need here's your path forward." Yeah. But when you leave here today, you're not really a CrossFit coach. And I started thinking, like, who makes this stuff up? Like, who makes up all this stuff? I'm like, oh, you get a weekend cert and then people don't open a gym because I had not really heard of it before. Yeah. A, I never heard of anyone doing that. No one actually provides an example of it. 
uh, saying like, hey, this person had no background in fitness, did a two, two day certification, now they, they run a gym. So I was kind of skeptical of that at first because I was like, well, show me, you know, show me the person yeah. that doesn't exercise, <clears throat> knows nothing, and is now hosting, you know, running a CrossFit gym. And my experience was a total 180 from, from what all these people had, had said negatively. And I was like, dude, it's, everything in there is pulled from something else. It's pulled from the best people of that domain. And when you leave, they tell you, you're not a coach. You haven't done enough. You haven't done the work. Even if you're a great athlete, it's a different skill set. You need to get experience, work with one person, build up to coaching small groups. Um, so I left the level one saying, man, that was, that was a phenomenal seminar. Yeah. I'd recommend, you know, I'd recommend to everybody. Absolutely. So it was, it was a totally different experience. And that's where I first started coaching and I started coaching and I was, I thought, damn, now I'm responsible for other people. Yeah. Like I got to learn, I got to learn more. If, if I'm just responsible for myself and I screw up, it's not that big a deal, but now um, I need to learn more. Yeah. Like I can't just I can't just know that like first level info. Like I gotta know the second, third level of it. Yeah. I gotta know I gotta understand this holistically. I need to understand how this impacts this. I need to I need to know this at a much greater level because I'm responsible for other people now and not just me. So that's where I really um got just slightly more and more involved um within CrossFit. Yeah. Is it, there's a there's a shift that happens when you're not just responsible for yourself, and part of that shift is the responsibility. <clears throat> but for myself, I can just I can find the solution to a problem as it comes up. So if I have if I have something I want to accomplish, I can just you know kind of reverse engineer it. Here's what I want to do. Here's where I'm at you know, and make a plan to get there. Yeah. But when you start working, you got to have as many tools as possible because, you know, you don't have that kind of time and you don't have that ability to make mistakes. The way that you can make them with yourself. Yeah. For me, if I screw up, no big deal. But with someone else, um, I'm not. I'm not allowing myself that that freedom to fail when it when I'm responsible for someone else's results. Yeah. Sometimes someone asks me a question. They're like, "Hey, why why are we doing this?" Basically, like, well, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. Yeah, and that's I'll, such a great attitude to, to have. I'll get back to you about why we're doing it. I don't really know. It's just we do it because we you know we do it just because. And I don't like that answer. I'm like, well, because it's dog, it's just how you're supposed to do it. Um, and so every time someone asks me a question like that, you know, I'd get done coached and be like, all right, I got to know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> like I, A, I got to know why. And then B, I got to know, is this the best way to do it? Yeah. Well, and that builds I a lot of within- credibility as well. So, you know, there are definitely coaches out there and people out there that are like, you know, they'll just make up an answer or they'll say, uh, I, I don't know, and never get back to you on it. But if you say, I don't know, but I will figure it out. And you come back with an answer that that builds credibility. It does. And, you know, eventually you get to a point where people don't have questions to ask you anymore. Because if, if as a coach, you're, you, you have a limited number of questions that people are going to ask you. And it's really not that many, to be honest. If, if, if you can break things down really, you know, to, to their fundamental elements, then there's not that many questions to, to really answer. So if you, can, if you can understand the fundamentals of the Olympic weightlifting movement and the fundamentals of the powerlifting movements and gymnastics, there's not that many questions to answer. And so if you if you put in the work to be able to answer them after your first year, there's not that many questions you can't answer. Yeah. 
after two or three years, it's, it's an unusual um, interaction where someone will have a question of like, hey, why are we doing this this way? And at first, it's like, I don't have an answer to anybody. It's like, hey, man, I'm just following the programming. That's what it says up there. And I'm doing it because the programmer wrote it up there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I don't really know why. If that's what it's written, hey, I can't, tell, I can't really tell you. Yeah. But slowly you develop that knowledge so that people aren't, when, when someone asks you a question, it, you can give them an honest answer. Yeah. And if you, if you make stuff up, if you make stuff up or just kind of go with the like, you know, it's just how we've always done it. You, you can get by on that for a really long time. But you, you, if, if you put in the work, that feeling does go away. Yeah. Like you never have that feeling of like, oh, I look stupid right now. Yeah. And they don't, th they don't, they're not buying what I said. Yeah. Well, and it, that, that passion of, I don't know, let me go figure it out. Like that's, that, that's probably a differentiator between just kind of your average coach and the greats, you know, the ones that are willing to actually go out, figure it out, come back, and then build that knowledge upon knowledge, which really like, Greg Glassman kind of did, right? He had a base level of knowledge and then he just continued on by <clears throat> doing what you said, pulling in the greats or the best of the best to create this program that, that has been created. Yeah, I think with and with CrossFit, <clears throat> you because people try to define CrossFit all the time, which is it's 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 extremely difficult. And I try to I try to explain it more, you know, the whole constantly varied functional movements at high intensity, all of that. Uh, you know, people have different goals, and. <clears throat> Sometimes their goals aren't always, you know, exactly what kind of CrossFit preaches. You know, some people don't always aren't strictly about performance or their goals. They just want to look better or they just yeah. want to feel better and they just want to do this. So when someone asks, you know, why should I apply the CrossFit methodology? To me, you know, as a CrossFit coach, the differentiator between a CrossFit coach and some other coach is that in CrossFit, we don't limit our tool set or we don't limit the tools on our tool belt because they have a certain name or because certain other people have used them before. I'm concerned with what is the best tool to use? You know, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? What are we trying to accomplish? What is the best tool to get that done? It might be a barbell. It might be a rower. It might be a jump rope. It might be anything. Yeah. So in CrossFit, it's you know, to answer that question, like, hey, why am I doing this? My answer, you know, every time I try to be, I try to get to, because this is the best way to accomplish that goal. Yeah. You know, if, if your goal is to get stronger, there's no better tool than the barbell. You can do all this other stuff, but that is your ultimate tool. You know, if your goal, if your goal is to run faster, well, obviously you got to run. Um, but it's, it's whatever whatever the goal is, I want to use the best tool possible. And I think within, with, you know, a lot of different sports that kind of become a click where you're limiting yourself to just this specific tool, you know, because I'm a weightlifter. So everything we do is a barbell, but you'll see people with like these crazy complexes of like three deadlifts, two clean, two front squat, a push press and a jerk and all this other stuff. When you're like, well, what is the point of all that? Like, you can't even remember. You're trying to figure out, like, all the reps you're supposed to do. So if someone articulates, you know, we want to get in shape. Well, there's better ways to get in shape than that. Yeah. Get on a rower. Start pulling. You get a little tired. Keep going. That'll get you in shape. If, if all this work you're doing is just to be in shape, when, you know, you don't got to limit yourself to the barbell. You can do other things. Yeah. And that's been like that's been the thing with uh, powerlifting or strongman. Um, you'll see guys in the strongman that it's like, dude, you can you can put down the odd objects. Yeah. Like you can do something normal for a day. Yeah. 
And you don't always have to train the implement or do something weird. Just go in, do normal stuff. And so that's where that's really where the whole the whole purpose of, of answering that question why every time. Yeah. Is because there might be a better way to accomplish this goal. You know, there might be a better tool to use, but I want to know what that tool is. Yeah. And how to use it. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, there are people are there for different purposes. So really that question is very individualized. You know, why are we doing this? Well, why are you doing CrossFit? Is it because you want to compete in CrossFit or you want to be a a, a good jiu-jitsu athlete or you want to be a stay-at-home mom that can lift all of her own stuff? You know, it, it kind of depends on the person as well. Yeah, people have people have you know pretty wide goals, and um, I don't I, I don't turn this up front, especially if they're if I, it doesn't matter what your goal is. A prescription is probably going to be the same thing. Yeah. It's, uh, until you know until you get to a point where you're you're really good and you're forced to specialize, which as people at the CrossFit Games have shown. You don't have to specialize until you're at a really advanced level. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The prescription, you know, the prescription, regardless of whether you want increased work capacity or improved health, or you just want to, you want to look better. Yeah. The prescription looks the 95% same. of the same as this person. I yeah. just explain it differently. Yeah. I'll give you a better, I'll give you a better rationale that sounds a lot better of why you're doing it. Yeah. But if we're comparing you know, what you're doing versus what someone else is doing, man, those look really similar. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, what did it look like for you to move from strongman into more of the weightlifting type movements? Did I lose you there? Well, I think you're, the audio cut out a little bit. Uh, yeah, sorry. Let me. It's um, a good old country reception right here. <laughs> well, it might be mine too. Let me let me do something really quick. I normally uh, do these at the gym where I know there's not a lot of people on the internet, but I'm gonna text my wife and ask if we can make sure the kids are off the internet. <laughs> Um, so the, the question was, um, how did it look for you moving from more of strong man to more weightlifting? Cause your, your weightlifting is phenomenal. I mean, you have really good mechanics and you lift a lot of weight. Um, how did that transition look? So I started weightlifting because I became a pro strong man and that was, I liked lifting, but it's very difficult to train without a coach. Yeah. And so I was, at the time, I was probably an hour and a half drive from the, from a good weightlifting gym. I'm probably an hour and a half from where Catalyst used to be. Okay. So when I was competing the strongman, I was like, man an hour and a half drive each way. That's three hour round trip. Yeah. And for something that I wasn't, for something that I wasn't willing to fully commit to yet, uh, I thought, man, that's, that's unreasonable. I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to do it yet just because um, I'm still competing in strong man. Yeah. So to, to do what is kind of just like, something for fun I said man three hours is just too much so once I was done with strongman I started doing a little more weightlifting <clears throat> and I started doing more weightlifting mainly because you only have a certain number of years you can really do weightlifting because as you get a little older you lose speed you lose flexibility and it's not something that you're going to be doing until old age at a, at a 
at the at a high level. Yeah. I mean, you'll see guys that are really good, but that's because they were great prior to that. Yeah. Like when someone's 40 and they're still killing it and weightlifting, yeah, it's because when they were 25, they were an absolute mother. Yeah. You're, you're not seeing the way that they can in strongman. The way that they can in powerlifting. So I was 23 at the time, I think. 23 at the time, almost 24. And I said, man, if I'm going to learn how to do weightlifting, that's got to be right now. Like, I don't have any big competitions coming up. I could use a break from some of the heavier movements of, like, heavy yokes, farmer carries, all the all the heavy stuff that really beats you up. So I just started practicing. And it's down to – I took it down to the fundamental level I could and yeah. just practiced the most basic of mechanics. And I spent a lot of time studying uh, youth weightlifters, youth teenage. The guys like uh, CJ Cummings, who was mm-hmm. who's young then, some of these young athletes that had started and were starting to make a name for themselves as teenagers. The reason I would I would study their technique from, from that their coaches are having them perform is that this is an athlete that, A, isn't coming from a different ground. Okay. Yeah. So pre-developed the cool ability, like through another. So when someone transitions from a different sport, they're already pretty good at certain things. So their technique is developed, you know, with kind of not a, a, it's hard to say imbalance, because that's usually considered a negative thing. Yeah. But an imbalance in terms of weightlifting. Like this person has unusually strong arms or unusually strong legs or some component to them that is that is exceptional because of what they used to play. Yeah. So I looked at them thinking, how is this high-level coach taking an athlete that doesn't know anything about barbell and developing them over time? So I would, I would study, you know, the fundamentals. I would look at, obviously I'm looking at the top lists that are going on, but looking at the younger guys coming up of like, what, you know, what are the commonalities amongst these, of these athletes that haven't gotten to a point yet where injury throws off their technique, where coaches are making deviations in their technique due to, uh, you know, body portion or, or other things like that. Uh, to to study, you know, what exactly should the lift look like? <clears throat> because when you see some of these really good competitors and they're a bit new, they're not pushing for records, their coaches had years to help them out and develop, you can see what what a lift should really look like. Yeah. You'll notice some top-level guys where it's like their technique looks a little funky because they broke their elbow three years ago. Yeah. So you look at you look at the top people thinking that's what it should look like. I'm like, no, 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 that's that's not what it should look like. His looks a little funky because his elbow was broken. He has you know, he tore his meniscus. Like they have all these accumulated injuries. Or maybe their body type's not perfect. Yeah. And so you if you only study the the, the guys at the top you kind of get a little bit more view of what you should be working on and what it can look like. So I really looked at the, the younger athletes of what, what, how are they practicing? Like, what does their technique look like? Because even though I'm a bit older, I said, I'm still a rookie in terms of weightlifting. So this is exactly how someone else would have me perform it. If you're early on, you're not going to let people deviate from optimal peak. You're going to be like, yeah. no, you have to year, let's say, of hammering the fundamentals, learning how to, and kind of taking a break from getting beat up from strongman. And then just kind of enjoyed it more and stuck with it. 
you know, I'll throw strongman stuff in for a while, but once you get, once you, once your technique is good enough where you can really do a snatch or clean and jerk workout and sufficiently stress the body to get stronger, it is more fun to perform. Yeah. I mean, at first it sucks because especially coming from strongman, it's like I'm working with weights on the snatch and the clean that are just, there, there's no stimulus there. Yeah, it's just simply, it's simply too light. And then you, you get a little better and a little better and a little better. Where now that workout becomes a little hard. And as as the technique improves, now it's a hard workout. Now I can really challenge myself and push. But for a good six months, it was like, dude, these these weights are so light compared to to you know, the stress of like heavy deadlifts or other things. Yeah. That I would say it it, it helps with technique simply because I could look at the weight and be like, I don't care at all what's on the bar. Um it's all gonna be it's all gonna be light. Yeah. Like com- compared to these other things, you know, like a heavy farmer carry for instance. Um, I'm not trying to push the weight on those weightlifting movements at first, simply because it's like, this is all of my training is technique work. It, it was probably six to 12 months of just technique work, because when you can deadlift, you know, triple that number for reps, it's like, well, how, how stressful is this snatch really? Yeah. It's not like I could, I could load three times the weight and deadlift it. So Early on, my only goal every session was how do I do this as best as I can? Yeah. And then the next session was how can I do this just a little bit better than last time? And um, there's a book called uh, Deliberate Pre- or Peak. There's a book called Peak. It's by Anders Erickson. He's the original um, author of that 10,000 hour rule. Okay, yeah. <laughs> It, it, it covers the concepts of deliberate practice. And so I treated the snatch and the clean and jerk as if it was deliberate practice where I would back out. I would ignore kind of the, the general physical stimulus that those lifts were providing and treating it the way that I would train a golf swing. Yeah. You know, you're not, you're not practicing golf in the sense of like, Oh, I'm going to develop all this power and I'm going to be, I'm going to develop strength and, and this general ability. Something like golf, you're looking at, I'm purely training the skill of swinging this club. Yeah. So early on, I would look at it just from the stance of treat this the way that I would practice golf and focus only on doing it as best as I can. Yeah. Then eventually, once, once the technique was there where you could, I could really express my strength through the movement, then it turned into, you know, how heavy can I go? Yeah. You know, how many reps can I do? How, how crazy can this get? But that took, that took at least a year to get to that point. Yeah. It's cool that you had that mentality. And it's so important that, like, new people know and understand that. That it, it, it's not going to come overnight. And those fundamentals. So you, you were a pro strongman. And kind of took yourself back on the weight and you're like, no, I have to learn the fundamentals here if I'm going to improve. So you said six months to a year, just working fundamentals. Yeah. I, you know, for instance, the snatch, I could already overhead squat. Okay. So I could overhead squat already. That wasn't an issue, but all the, all the stuff in between, um, there were certain things that I would look at. And so I would, I would think of the snatch more like an engineer where I look at what is the bottleneck in this lift? Yeah. What is the one element that is holding me back the most? And in the, both the snatch and the clean, the clean, I couldn't hook grip. Okay. I just, if you're not hook gripping, you, you take some time to, to wear into the hook grip. Yeah. Because you do cleans and strongman. Yeah. So my clean was 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 awful. 
simply because I couldn't hook grip. So like I couldn't power clean anywhere near where I should have been just because I'm, I'm double overhanding the bar. Yeah. So it was, you know, looking at those bottlenecks. So with the clean, it was, I got to learn how to hook grip. And that's going to take me from this point to this point. In the snatch and the clean, I could not, I could not move weight off the ground with a neutral spine. I just couldn't do it. And that's not a strength problem because like I said, I could put twice the weight on the bar and I deadlift this no issue. But yeah. in that deadlift, there's a slight round to the back. Mm -hmm. And for strong men, you do a lot of movement um, with a flexed spine. Yeah. Uh, particularly things like stone. Yeah. You know, when you pick a stone up, you have a flexed back. So the ability to extend through the spine was except was exceptionally strong because that's one of the few sports where you're really going to develop that ability to extend uh, through the spine. Yeah. So things like stone loads and in particular, if you're short, you know, they love to throw in like a tall platform <laughs> yeah. for stones because all the short guys can't reach it. So if you're a shorter guy and you're competing, especially if you're competing at the, at, with heavyweights, they're going to put a tall stone or they're going to put a tall platform or bar for you to hit. So I had trained that ability to move weight off the ground with a flex spine and then be able to extend to be able to reach those tall platforms. So when I came over to learn how to snatch and clean a jerk, I could not get in position with a neutral spine. Yeah. And then it's the same thing when you finish the extension on either the snatch or clean. I could not finish with the legs. And so when I'm looking at it, I said, it's not a strength issue of the back. It's not a strength issue of the legs. I said, I can, uh, if we look at my squat, there, that's obviously not a leg strength problem. Yeah. I just, my brain, my brain cannot perform this movement. It cannot express this strength the way that it needs to. So at first it was, Every single day, practice, how can I snatch and clean with a neutral spine over and over and over again? And basically, nothing else is even worth practicing. It's one of the concepts of, of deliberate practice. Um, I didn't know it at the time. I hadn't read the book yet. But to me, it made sense, you know. Where is the bottleneck? Where is the single thing that is going to make the biggest improvement? And it was that. Yeah. I cannot move the weight off the ground with a, with a neutral spine. And then moving on, once that problem is fixed, move on to the next problem, which for the clean and jerk was my rack position. <clears throat> you know, years of heavy pressing, um, my upper body was just way too stiff to even – to even remotely come close to doing a, a full clean. Yeah. So it was, okay, now that I can comfortably power clean and put the bar overhead, I got to learn a rack position so I, you know, I don't break my wrist when I, when I get into a full clean. Yeah. Um, and so just moving on from a series of what's the biggest, most pressing issue and putting all of the energy towards that then the next one, then the next one, until you start getting more and more nitpicky. So when someone comes at our gym and we, we start learning the lifts, I try to explain to them that when you go all the way up, even to the Olympic level, people don't perform these movements and say, that was perfect. I got nothing to work on. Yeah. They're just more nitpicky about it. Yep. They're, they're not saying, hey, I got, I got no room for improvement in my technique. Because even if it's a 1% improvement, 1% at those weights is a lot of weight. Yeah. So to the untrained eye, you might look at these two lists and be like, I can't tell the difference. And I'll say, you're right. Even a great coach looks at those two and they can't tell the difference until you break out the slow-mo yeah. and go frame by frame. Now you can get even more nitpicky about it. Yeah. So on day, right when we first learn them, I say, you're not going to get to that point of perfection where you're like, I'm done, out of here, see you later. You're only going to get at, 
at first you're going to go from awful to just less awful to okay to you know it's pretty good yeah great as you get beyond great you start getting more and more nitpicks so i try to explain that when you know that perfection isn't going to be there you can enjoy this process a lot more because you know it's not going to stop but you can appreciate when you when you go when you make that leap from just being absolutely terrible to just you know not that bad you can appreciate that because later down the road you're still going to be making those jumps yeah you know you 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 can't be upset that you're not you're not uh, at some place in your technique that you want to be because it doesn't exist like that there is no end point and it helps people it helps people clear their head and not overthink you know every detail yeah so that they can focus on improvement otherwise otherwise they get in and they're just like man i suck I'm like well you're gonna suck for a long time just so we're yeah. aware yeah like you're gonna suck for a while we just want to suck less until we become pretty good yeah yeah and even then so, once you you're know, pretty good like you said then there's the nitpicky stuff so it's it's a journey that never ends. It's pretty awesome if you have that mindset. Yeah, and I, I say, you know, you look at your technique and you know, you look at you look at um what you think I'm thinking of your technique, which is, you know, yeah, it's not not the best. But you gotta understand that someone else is looking at me the way that I'm looking at you right now. Like, oh, man, this guy's got a lot of work on. Yeah. Because they've done these lifts at a higher level. And so when they break down a video of me lifting, they're going to they're gonna point these things out right away. Like, oh, that can be improved. He could do better at this. He could do better at this. I said, someone's looking at me the way that I'm looking at you right now. Yeah. So you can't, you can't get worked up about, you know, not your technique not being where you want it or worry about it not being good enough. You just got to block all that stuff out and focus on what is the next step? You know, what is the next step? What is the next step? And knowing that perfection is not coming, you'll do that fundament. You'll do that work on the fundamentals early on that you otherwise wouldn't do. Yeah. You're going to rush that process the whole time. I was like, Oh, I want to get to this point or I want to lift this, this certain weight. When if you can just, if you can, if you know ahead of time, hey, you're never getting there. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna enjoy this journey. Yeah. And when you when you go through that process, and it, it's not just lifting; it's you get to it's other things as well. You're gonna you're gonna go into a different endeavor with that same skill set of how, of being able to identify and solve problems and take a step forward that you otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah. <clears throat> so even if it's even if it's in business, you're going to be able to look at all right, you know, what is what is our next step? What do I need to do to improve? You're going to be able to continually you're going to be able to apply these lessons elsewhere. Yeah. Obviously on physical tasks. If yeah. someone's an incredible weightlifter or or a gymnast or anything that requires high skill you're going to jump into some other athletic endeavor and you know the process. You're going to apply the exact same thing you've learned. You're going to pick that up really quickly. It's what, you know, you see pro athletes do these charity events and people are shocked when it's, when basketball players come in and they're, they're bowling like a 250. Yeah. And so, <laughs> they're, they're some of the best athletes in the world. You don't think they know how to bowl. Yeah. Like they're, you, Give them a couple weekends, they'll at least be okay. Yeah. So I, I explain it like, hey, you can go do any physical task. Yeah. So this isn't this isn't like a just a a wild goose chase of like, oh, I'm never gonna be better at it. No, if you pick one thing and you really execute and get really good at it, you can learn all things. Yeah. Any physical thing. And then when it's outside of that physical task. You'll be good at the non, you know, workout stuff too, whether it's business, 
it's your relationship, it's your kids. You're going to approach it the same way. Yeah. And take what you learn and improve. No, I completely agree with all of that. Um, have you heard of Harv Ecker, T. Harv Ecker? He wrote a book called no. Se- Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. Some, something that he always says is how oh, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how you do anything is how you do everything. And when you're explaining all of that right there, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, eight years of, I've done CrossFit for about eight years and I've never been like a great CrossFitter, you know, I'll go do local competitions and stuff and it's fun. I I have a good time. I would like to be like a better CrossFitter, but I started jujitsu a while ago and, um, in, in learning that process, it, it's very much like CrossFit. You know, you go there, you don't know anything. You start to learn things little by little. And I started picking up on it pretty quick. And I was like, that's because of CrossFit. You know, it's because of the time that it took me to learn the progressions there and learn to be patient and learn the lifts. And, you know, then you get into another sport and it's like, oh, oh, that's why. And how you do everything or how you do anything is how you do everything. Like it, I completely agree. 100% everything you just said right there. So. You see, once, uh, you know, once I went through kind of learning the lift, um, I'll be honest, I got a little lazy for a period of time. So I had finished school. Um, started working outside of the gym, got a little fat, got a little lazier. Um, I got a little comfortable. And then uh, COVID hit. So COVID hit and it kind of, it kind of forced a reassessment of value. Yeah. And things that I, I hadn't fully bought into that I realized were making me worse. I just totally rejected and was like, I always thought that was nonsense. I'm not doing that anymore. So there's stuff like, you know, the idea of balance. And I started, I started realizing like, man, I don't really like to just sit around relaxing. Yeah. You know, that's not me. I don't, it might, it might outwardly look like relaxing, but like when I'm done at the gym, I would rather pick up a book and train my mind. Like I'm physically tired, but mentally I'm, I'm still ready to go. Um, so I just wasn't like a, a sit on, sit around watching Netflix kind of guy. Yeah. And I was, I, I was, I was slightly trying to be, Yeah. you know, the, the couple, the bit of time before COVID hit, I was kind of trying And be like, you know what, you know, not, not don't seriously, but like, you don't have to strive to be the best of stuff. Um, you know, you can just be a well-balanced guy. Like, you know, she'll go up to work, do a good job at work, you know, be a good husband, be a good dad, have some time for hobbies, all that. And I didn't really believe in it at first. And COVID hit, and all I'll say about it is that the people promoting that stuff, I didn't like how they acted during COVID. And I thought, you know what, this is nonsense. So for since we're in California, I mean, owning a gym in California uh, for those first six months was brutal. I bet. Um, being shut down, then <clears throat> opening, then being out in the parking lot when it's 105 degrees outside. Then on top of that, like, so we followed every single rule and guideline and regulation there was. At no point had we ever broken the rules. And still, you know, people called the city and they called the county. They called every state department on us. And I said, hey, man, we are following every single regulation. And people just continued to uh, continue to harass us. Yeah. And I was like, hey, what do you want? Don't be mad at us. Dude. Go talk to your politician and have them say, hey, these guys can't be open at all. Yeah. But as far as, as far as following the rules, 
I said, man, I followed every single one of them. And it, it, people still are all over us. So once COVID hit, I had like six months of being like, you know what? Enough of all this stuff. You know, I'm not really living the way that, that I personally agree with. So my workouts just hit a totally different level. Yeah. They just like, that was for six months. And it's something that I explain, you know, CrossFit preaches that intensity is the driver of results. Yeah. So for a good six months, the intensity was just off the charts. Just back to, it was, it was back to being like a, a teenager again. Like the excitement of going to the gym and training was like back to like teenager level when you're like, you know, you can train as hard as you want. And you're never sore and you're excited. Yeah. It was like back to that level of intensity for a solid six months. Um, and that, that kind of correlates with the same time I started posting more on social media because we had to. Yeah. Um, so I quickly got back to like, you know, I was slowly declining a little bit. Um, and then six months of like the best workouts of my life. I'm right back to all time shape right away. By the window, six months were up. And so for six months, it was like every time I'd be a little tired, I would just think of like, I would remember like, oh, hey, someone called the city and made a fake complaint about it. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> I love that. Let's see. I um, I started I started doing some benchmark workouts or some classic CrossFit stuff where I say, "Hey, I got an hour to train. Let's see where we can take this." And then at that point, that's kind of where the the, the social media popularity came up, and um. Sorry, man. I, I don't know if it's my connection or, or what, but every once in a while you're cutting out. I'm sorry about that. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. Yeah, so sorry, you were talking benchmarks, and um, that's kind of when your popularity on social media started to really take off? That, um, I started posting them. I did, it really picked up. I did a 330 Isabel, and we are, so we're, we are an hour and a half from, uh, maybe a little less than an hour and a half from Aromas. And Dave Castro uh, likes to go duck hunting. Yeah. So where we're located is really is, is a really popular duck hunting spot. So he had never come to our gym because it's always around the holidays. And so we'll have like an off schedule. So he had not made it in yet. So he came in. He posted us. Um, he posted something up about our gym and then issued a new uh, Dave Castro challenge. Yeah. Which was, if, if someone could do that 3.30 Isabel under 20 minutes. <laughs> and he didn't know he didn't know at the time, but that, that 3.30 Isabel I did was, and this is, this is a weird thing, and this kind of goes into training philosophy a bit, is it's really hard it's really hard to, to, the stronger you get, the harder it is to program and expect performances on certain days. Yeah. So everything could go wrong and you, you're Superman and you can do everything right. And just that day, it's not there. So if I remember correctly, we had some friends over for like the day after Christmas. So we had spent all Saturday drinking. 
and I mean all from like 5 p.m. on, just drink nonstop. Sunday, I wasn't even hungover. I woke up for on Sunday. If I wake up, it's like that. So I, I do nothing on Sunday. So I go to the gym on Monday. I start working out, warm up. And at first, I just thought, you know, I had no expectations of the day. And was like, well, you know, we'll find out what I can do. And it felt, you know, way better than I thought it was going to feel. <clears throat> so I had, I had gotten up in weight. And then I thought, well, I'm just going to do as many reps as I can at 3.30. And so I did the first one. You know, did another one, did another one, and then it became, they were so good that I thought, you know, I'm holding this minute pace, see how long I can hold it. Yeah. Then somewhere around, you know, like rep, rep like, you know, seven or eight happens, and I thought, holy shit, let's, let's see if I can push this to 30. Yeah. Um, 30 is always my cutoff. Like, that's always, to me, um... Most of like a heavy workout will probably be between, you know, 10, 15 reps. Uh, but if they feel incredible, I always go up to 30 just because that's Isabel. Yeah. So I, I, <laughs> I just, I kept hitting mates and hit, hit the uh, 30 rep mark. So I had posted the video. So when he issued the challenge, I'm like, well, that time was after a weekend of drinking the whole time. <laughs> So he put up a thing, if anyone can do it in 20 minutes. And I said, well, well, shit, if everything goes well, well, let's, I bet I can do 20 minutes. So that's what, that's what kind of, what, like, initially boosted my following because people knew me locally just from Strongman and other stuff like that. And I started posting more regularly. I was like, all right, you know, let me put up another video. <clears throat> and then every, every video I put, you know, the algorithm works where it's like, okay, you have these, these n- new followers. It's going to show, show your video to them. Let's see if their friends like it. Oh, shit, you know, I should probably post more. Yeah. Post a little more. Uh, I'll post a little more. Um, then I want an open workout. And it just comes slowly the same thing. Like people would see the video more. I have more followers. Then they're like, well, I should probably post more. Until yeah. it started becoming like a regular thing. But before it was like every two weeks, maybe every month. Yeah. So it was mostly like uh, just that kind of popularity grew a little bit. Posting that stuff up pretty cool um uh, i wanted to ask you about your fridge (laughs) because that is the most beautiful thing every sunday uh i think it's the sundays that you post it uh is that your fridge or is that your family's fridge that's a family fridge all right we uh i started posting to them and we only really started meal prepping when we had kids and it's kind of a it's kind of the same thing that I talked about. Like, you know, when we do nutrition coaching with people, the very first thing we try to identify is what is the single biggest problem that you have. Like, what is the root cause of like every time you um, either eat something you you don't want to eat or don't eat something you want to eat. Like, what is what is holding you back? So when we had kids, now it became you know, we can't, we can't cook at home as often. And then trying to cook for only like two or three days at a time just wasn't feasible. Yeah. Um, something always pops up. So <clears throat> once we had our second kid, we started doing, um, say, hey, we got to cook the whole week. Like we, we have to start. So we normally do it Sunday night now. I said, we got to have, we got to have five days plus Saturday breakfast ready to go um, because we won't have time during the week. 
So we uh, started cooking for a full week. And we had this, we had this seven step process that we were using with people at the gym that was really successful at the gym, but I hadn't seen anyone kind of cover that idea yet. You see it a lot with, um, you see it a lot with habits-based coaching where people will talk about it, but then when it's like, there's, there's a hierarchy to those habits. Like yeah. some matter more than others. So we started posting, we, we went through that seven step process ourselves, realized that, hey, we're failing because we're already planned to be able to cook. We can't cook. Then we're eating stuff for a full day of like whatever convenient stuff we can, we can put together. So we started cooking for a full week and then organizing the fridge to where it looks the way that it looks when I, when I post it up. Yeah. And then just said, hey, like part of posting that up is that you know when you start off at the gym at, at a, when you're younger i got to hear it from people all the time it's like oh you don't understand you don't have kids so i have i've heard that so of oh you don't get it oh you guys that now that we have kids i'll be like no 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 you need to do this more yeah, like you have to do it more. We don't prep. We didn't meal prep before because I can just go home and cook. Yeah. And so we started posting that up, um, and sharing all of those steps along with it. Of like, you know, the fridge is one aspect of it, which is really critical for someone that <coughs> for someone that has kids, but if they don't then it's not as important. So we we put that one up just mainly because I've had to hear it so many times from people about, oh, I, you know, we have kids and we can't do this. And uh, we started saying like, hey, this is this is how we do it. And it's not it's not really about the nutrition part of it. It's it's the speed, it's the convenience. And when I get home or just any time during the day, I'm better at everything I do if you can have the hunger problem solved. Yeah. Like those those Snickers commercials about, you know, you're not you when you're hungry. Uh, <laughs> they're they're popular because they're true. Like I can tolerate I can tolerate so much more from my kids if I'm full than if I show up at home and I'm hungry and now they're fighting they're going off about something. I said, this, none of this stuff that you see here is really about the nutrition of it. It's all about those other factors where now I'm not hungry, so I can be a way better dad. That's because cool. I'm not going to get irritated about the little tiny stuff that I, otherwise I'd be irritated. Yeah. Like if, if I show up at home, I'm hungry, I'm trying to cook dinner and these two are fighting. <laughs> yeah. um, that whole interaction is not going to go well. Yeah. But now taken care of ahead of time, you know, I can, I can deal with this. Yeah. So the, the fridge isn't completely about nutrition, but what, what do you do for nutrition? Do you try to follow certain macronutrients or are you kind of meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds type of guy, or what, what do you do? We do not really track that much anymore. I used to be diligent about it when I had to keep my weight. Um, for weigh-ins. So now that I'm not in a weight class, I have spent enough time tracking to know what the meal should look like. Yeah. So I don't need, it's not that we're, it's not that I'm not tracking. It's that I kind of have, I kind of have a base diet. And then anything on top of that, I recognize right away as being unnecessary. So in the course of, in the course of seven days, you know, I'll probably have typically eat five meals a day. One of those we might eat out or we might cook a big dinner at home. So I need 34 meals. Yeah. And the first meal of the day is almost always. 
and I can cook that easily at home. Um, we buy pre the pre-cooked hard eggs at Costco. So if one meal is eggs, the last meal of the day is always uh, yogurt and fruit or cottage cheese and fruit. Yeah. And instead of fruit, sometimes I throw some jelly or stuff that tastes better. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, it's just a there's 14 meals out of the way. So now I'm down to only 20 meals that I got to cook. And that's usually what you see in the fridge. You normally see about 15 to 20 meals in there lined up ahead of time. So those are what I eat most of the time. We'll cook at home a few times, um, sometimes during the weekdays, uh, definitely on the weekends, Saturday, Sunday night. And then everything on top of that, I recognize as, hey, this, I don't need to do this. And it's not really beneficial or critical, but I'm going to eat it because I like it. So if I have like, sometimes my kids will come home with their food from school. So it'll be like, I'll eat the kids' food. Or we'll have, this, we'll have some other kind of dessert. Or any other kind of snack or something else. It makes it clear that if I got to bring my weight down, like it's been creeping up for a bit. I'm like, ah, you know what? I got to cut this stuff out. All I do is just strict about, hey, it's all cooked. It's all there. And it's just a hard no. Like, yeah. no, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. I don't want, you know, the donuts you brought. I don't want that. I just say no to it. And if I, if I feel like I have a little bit of room where, hey, things are being well, I'm training hard, I can let some of that stuff slide and just not worry about it. So there's the, <clears throat> the article's old now, but it was the, uh, the founder of Precision Nutrition. He put out an article a long time ago about the concept of displacement. And it was, you know, the food that you eat, it's not, it's not just, you know, if you eat junk food, it's not just the impact of that you eat. It's the fact that you're not eating nutritious food as well. Yeah. And that's the concept that I think, you know, when, when people start getting in, start ripping on cross about the whole no sugar thing, and they start getting into these ridiculous arguments about like, well, you know, carbohydrate, all carbohydrates break down, all yada, yada. Sure. You can make all those arguments you want, but in terms of processed refined sugar, you don't need any of it. Yeah. Now, how much is harmful? It depends on the dose. A yeah. little bit, not a problem. Most people aren't having a little bit. Yeah. Most people, but it's way too much. <clears throat> Second, they're not understanding this idea of displacement. People aren't eating, you know, meat and vegetables, nuts and seeds, all this stuff. And then on top of that, adding sugar. Yeah. They're having sugar first yeah. and then not eating any of that nutritious stuff. Yeah. So it's not like, hey, they had too much dessert. No, no, no. All they had was dessert. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're missing that point. Like, when they ate breakfast, they didn't have any eggs. They didn't have any fruit. They didn't have any vegetables. They didn't have anything of real nutritional quality. It was just pancakes. Yeah. When I really started just focusing on protein. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah, audio is a little bit, little bit off, so I, I stepped on you there. Oh, that's fine. I uh, just when I really so, so started that, that concept. Of <laughs> Sorry. Displacement... Keep going. You go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Um, when I I'm just agreeing with you, and um, when I really started to focus on protein, like, hey, I'm gonna try to hit one gram of protein per pound that I weigh, uh, maybe one point two five. I didn't consciously stop eating sweets. I just stopped eating so many sweets because it was displaced with other real foods. And so crazy body composition changes. And it's like, I didn't stop eating sweets. I just focused on protein and all of a sudden, subconsciously, I'm eating way less sugar. Yeah, so I think 
that concept of displacement is probably the number one thing that I try to apply for nutrition is it's gram of gram of protein per pound of body weight. Um, I don't really add that much fat because your protein sources will have fat in them. Yeah. So I'll add some, but, but it's really, it, it doesn't need to be very much. I make sure that I have enough carbohydrate for some of the higher intensity workouts. Uh, so I eat rice. It's mostly rice and potatoes yeah. and fruit. Vegetables, I, don't, I, I just don't like these vegetables. Nothing against them. Yeah. Then anything on top of that is it's very easy to identify. Like, hey, hey this is totally unnecessary. And it's not beneficial. This, this piece of this, – these brownies are not better than me eating – you know, a fruit salad. Yeah. It's not, it's not beneficial at all. Now, is it harmful? This amount? Probably not. It's not going to be that big of a deal. But a lot of people can't even get to that first point. Yeah. Where if you ask the question, okay, it's not harmful, but is it beneficial? You know, are you telling me that there's a benefit to eating this? And a lot of times, because people have, like, they've already decided, like, they're going to rip on CrossFit's uh, motto about nutrition. Like, they won't even get into this, this kind of basic, basic thing. So when it comes to changing your food, it's like you have an, you have an asymmetric um, risk. Like, there's only upside to changing your food. If you switch all that junk out, is it, is it going to harm you? Definitely not. No way. Is it going to benefit you? Maybe. But if it doesn't benefit you, you're in the same spot. Yeah. And if it, does, if, uh, if it doesn't benefit you, you're in the same spot. And if it does, you're better off. So you literally have nothing to lose. You only have, you only have to gain from here. So all that meal prep is just to get the foundation of my food. You know, this is what I'm going to repair my body with. This is what's going to fuel the exercise. On top of that, it's easy to say, hey, I'm eating this because it's delicious and it's fun. And if it, if, it, if it becomes a problem, that makes, it, that makes all the habits the same. It's very easy to cut out. Whereas when that stuff is, when you're not really willing to be honest about it, and it's kind of, you know, intermixed into your regular life and regular day, it's hard to get rid of. Yeah, I agree. It's cool that you, uh, you're so disciplined with it. Um, have you heard of Stan efforting? Yeah. Yeah. So I was chatting with him and, and he just said, he's like, from a very young age, like nutrition is just, it's just part of it. And it just, he inherently understands that there are certain things that you just need to get in a day, whether it's macros and micros and, um, I just admire that. Admire that in you that you've got that and in him and just anyone like bodybuilders are pretty good at like macros, but then you get deeper into, you know, those, those micros and knowing what you need to hit. It's uh, it's cool. So that's admirable. Good job. I, I enjoy seeing your, your fridge pictures. <laughs> yeah. And Stan, Stan Efferding is a good example because, you know, at any of these, on any of these aspects of like, you know, how you should apply it to your own training. Stan Efferding has like an extreme survivorship bias, you know, in his own results. So I would say, you know, if you look at guys in their fifties that are as jacked as, as Stan Efferding. Yeah. The guys that are jacked in their fifties, all their lifestyle looks extremely similar. Like they all do the exact same things. So if you want to get to that point, you're not going to see people eating garbage. You're not going to see guys pounding booze. You're not going to see them not sleeping. Yeah. They won't make it to be at that level of performance in your 50s. So people will always bring up like, you know, they'll bring up someone who, you know, they do all the wrong things and they're 25. It's like, okay, but how good would they be if they, if they, you know, didn't have those things? Yeah. You know, they would probably be better. 
So <laughs> I've always tried to apply the things that these old guys are doing. You know, the earlier you can do what those old guys are doing, the better your results are going to be. So, it you know, with nutrition, it's obvious. Hey, these guys that are old and jacked, none of them eat junk. Yeah. You're not going to see it. Maybe some in their 40s, a small amount in their 30s. Yeah, somewhat common in your 20s. But not when you get to that age. Yeah. So you don't see, you know, the impact it has because it hasn't had time to, to accumulate or compound yet. Yeah. And that's like the same. It, you could look at it the same way with training when a lot of these older guys, <clears throat> you've seen a lot of strength athletes moved across it as they get older. <clears throat> and uh, Dmitry Klokov is a good example. That's like, dude, these weights are just are beating me up. Yeah, I need some. I need another form of exercise. You know, I've always been of the opinion that why would I use a heavy weight if a lighter weight will produce the same stimulus? And it's the same reason when you look at someone like Stan Effery, that's that's also that strong at that age. Okay, well, how are these guys training? How are they taking care of their body? Yeah. You know, could I could I apply that earlier on so that uh, my results now are better and that I can last that long? I like that. I like how you look at uh, the older people and you learn from them. Like you said, with the weightlifting, you you looked at the younger people. You seem very analytical in your thought. Like you you think things through really well. So that's um, I, I like that a lot. Um, I appreciate your time um coming on it's been about an hour and a half so i don't want to take too much of your time but um man just like from my selfish standpoint like you just keep it up because i i love watching your content (laughs) um love hearing people talk about it um and it's fun to see that progression over time and just uh how old are you do you like 30 35 31 oh 31 i'm sorry i added four years onto you there Um, yeah it's fine Oh, dude. So you're young. You've got plenty of time to keep getting stronger and, and yeah, yeah I, got, I got some years left. Heck yeah. That's awesome. So you want an open workout. So you do the open every year. Mm-hmm. You have any yeah. cro- CrossFit goals? Uh, not really. Okay. Well, you just need to get to 35 and then you're like a shoe in for the master. I got to, uh... <laughs> Oh, I need to get a sub three friend. Okay. That used to be the sub three Fran used to be a, a big deal. Uh, it's, it's not a big deal anymore, but um, a sub three at a high body weight. Is yeah. Still a big how, deal. how much do you weigh? <laughs> 255. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so muscle. Gotta, so it's, it's a good I weight. Bring the, I got to bring the weight down a bit to get that under three minutes, but. Uh, those fast, those fast friend times are usually like buck 80. So yeah. Yeah. They're little, they're little people. Um, I gotta, I gotta break. I gotta get the friend time. And then I've kind of taken the last few months. Um, well, the last four weeks I injured my hand. So oh, like shoot. my, my Olympic weightlifting has been some, hasn't been, hasn't been very good. And the last few months have kind of been, just uh, a bit on cruise control. Yeah. So this will probably be my this will probably be my first year of really being like a resolutioner. That's cool. Like I'm setting, going to uh, some goals in 2000 or in uh, 23. Yeah, I got two weeks to figure it out. I'm going to Vegas this weekend, and then uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to start. Uh, January 1st. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to be a resolutioner for the first time. That's awesome. I used to write that stuff off and be like, hey, man, just start right now. Yeah. But uh, there's kind of been a a point in time where it's like, you know, you can't really, you can't really be at your best all the time. And so when you, when you slide a little bit, you know, let things heal, you know, kind of reset your mind a bit. This will be my first year that I'm like, all right, I'm going to set, I'm going to write these down and actually not, not, I'm kind of a, in the extreme of like staying in the moment. Yeah. 
So this is my first one of like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to chop some of these things down. Um, like certain lifetime PRs that, that I can say I hit for, for 2023. Yeah. Dude, there's something powerful about writing it down. Um, I've, I've talked about that for a long time. There's just, there's actually this little tiny, I usually have it here. This little book it's called, um, Oh man, I, it's, it just left me. It's a tiny book. I'll send you what it is. Um, but writing your goals down and reading them every day, like it sounds so simple and it's hokey and it's like, you're putting it out in the universe and it's all this crazy hokey stuff, but it works. Um, it's, it's my, my wife's a writer. She writes, she writes every, you know, she writes them all out. Yeah. And with goals, so my, my, my thoughts on goals have always been, you know, if you have a big goal, you know, in the future, you know, if you take a year goal, you know, you break it down to three month check marks, and then you have kind of like monthly, weekly, and you can even get down to daily. And then your habits are, you know, your smallest unit yeah. that you're building on. So if I've always said, you know, I think these goals, hold you back because when you break these goals down so like what's it going to take on a daily basis you realize like oh man that's nothing that's that's nothing at all i could easily do that and so well we got to aim bigger so i said if you take if you take the the stance of like all right each day i'm going to maximize the day you know i'm worried you know you wake up what can i do before the day is over I said, as long as you're on, as long as you're on a good trajectory, you know, that goal you reach is going to be a lot bigger. Yeah. If every single time, you know, every time you feel like, ah, uh, you know, I'm going to kind of slack off and take the day off, um, kind of setting a goal, you know, becomes the limit for yeah. a lot of people. I'm like, I'm happy that, but you're not seeing what you could have been. Yeah. Whereas if you, if you take it on like a one day, on a one day basis of like, you know, I want to make sure I'm still going north. Or I want to make sure I'm still going east. I'm, I'm heading towards the right direction. But how far can I get today? Yeah. It drives my wife nuts because she's, she, she's very, uh, writes it down, very clear. And uh, I take the stance of like, hey, how, what, can we, what can we do right now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, can you imagine if we all focused on getting as much done in a day as possible and being as efficient as possible. I mean, you, you'll surprise yourself in a year, two years, three years, you'll get, you'll get farther than, than you think. I mean, not you, you have that mindset. I'm talking like, you know, the general population, usually it's just get through the day, but what if, what if we focused on. To make as, it, yeah. Make it to this point. Like, yeah. I just got to make it till I get home. Yeah. When it's like, if, what if you thought of getting home as like, all right, it's the fourth quarter. Yeah. I got a, I got a whole quarter of the day left. Exactly. What can be built? How can we change the world? How can we help people? How can we add value? All right. Well, hey, I, uh, I appreciate you taking your time. Appreciate everything you're doing. Where can people find you? Uh, Instagram at Wall Street Weightlifter. Um, same name on TikTok. On Twitter, it's fifty to one method. Fifty to one method. Okay. Twitter, they they cut a character out of your name. You can't. Uh, I'm over the lake, so. So you had to change it on there. Uh, you plan on I doing have, any? I change it. Any YouTube stuff in the future? I have one set up. Uh, I haven't, um, haven't fully gotten it out yet. Okay. Well, when you do, I, I imagine, uh, it will be, the it will first, be good. For 2023. So I have a, I have a template available on a uh, trade heroic. It kind of takes people through what the 51 method is and the basic ideas. Cool. So the YouTube channel at first will be, kind of a longer form explanation of what's included for your coach's instructions. So once you read through them, get the high level information, 
if you're if you need more info on it, then you can go to YouTube and see a longer explanation of it. So, so is that method on some, Train Heroic right now? Like, is that program yeah. up? So people can go find yeah, you there too. And general, that method. Cool. Yeah, it's a general strength training program. Um, it's not as long as you have access to just a regular CrossFit gym. It's there. There's nothing that is too complicated for people to do. Yeah. So as long as you can back squat, deadlift, and overhead press, you can follow it. All the accessory stuff, the, the Olympic weightlifting, it's not critical to the program. It gives you a way to kind of introduce yourself to them. And people just started using it about six weeks ago or so. Yeah. So before they finish the eight weeks, I'll start getting some videos up of how, how to adapt that time they run it. So when someone buys the program, they have access to the app for a year. You can follow it for eight weeks. You can go right into the next one or take a week off. So you can run it six, you know, six times in a year. But each time you do it, it becomes an iterative process where I'm going to go watch this video. Now I understand this idea a little bit more. As I do it next time, it's going to be a little bit better. You know, I see the accessory work he put in here, but I understand why it's there. And so maybe I'm going to swap that exercise out a little bit yeah. or emphasize, emphasize this or that. So that's going to be, that's going to be all the first YouTube content. That's awesome. I just got to get around to it. One of these weekends. It's not yeah. going to be this weekend. <laughs> yeah. Vegas. That'll be fun. Um, I have a friend who uh, her, her name's Christine and she has a YouTube channel called frugal fit mom <coughs> and um, does very well on youtube so with your knowledge your experience your instagram following um you know just ideas that's some something that uh, a direction that you could possibly go that i i personally think you'd do really well on so yeah <laughs> all right man i appreciate it hey no i appreciate you um thanks for everything if you ever need anything reach out you know i'm in idaho so i don't know what i can do but i'm happy to happy to help out however i can um, I'll get this up. I'll let you know when it's up and we'll just push it out to as many people as possible. And, and like I said, I just appreciate your time and your content. All right. Thank you. So, all right. Hey, thanks. We'll, uh, we'll chat soon.